today. Um, I was getting some conversation in the chat. I'm here, Deb, I promise. I was here, and then my camera disconnected. It's funny because my camera will work all day long for multiple classes over the course of the day, and then by the time it gets to be 10 o'clock, um, it likes to, it likes to turn off on me. All right, but can everybody hear me all right? See my fingers? Haha. <laughs> Ah, alrighty. So I'm glad you can see me and yes, hear me. All right. So I am just about to get my. Oh, I'm in the wrong direction. Watch me flip around. This is happening. There we go. All right. So I'm back. My computer got to go a little wild, but that's fine. Um, there we go. Okay. We got that figured out. So, um, yep, let's try that again. My name is Trisha, and I am here to sketch with you guys today. I see that we do have uh, about five people here with us already, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we had Marley in the chat saying, hey, let's do Hymenopterin. Well, funny thing is, Marley always says, let's do Hymenopterin, but, um, I actually did have this giant resin bee already sitting under the microscope from an earlier class, so I figured we might as well talk about leafcutter bees, and this guy right here, he's, um, called a giant resin bee. Um, he is in the family Megachylidae, which are the leaf cutter bees. <laughs> and I do know that the giant resin bee is technically invasive. It's not native to um, North America. I believe it's native to Eastern Asia. So it is actually a pretty large, it's actually a pretty good sized um, leaf cutter bee. So uh, my specimen on the microscope, I actually have three of these. I actually have three of these fellas in my collection because at MSU, at the Natural Science Building, um, there was a, I don't remember what type of tree it was, but it was a tree that was from Eastern Asia. And so, um, these bees would actually come to the tree every year and we would bring out 20, you know, 15 foot, 20 foot bug nets and we would collect these giant resin bees for the collection at MSU. And I, I snagged a couple. I admit, I did get stung by one of these guys once, um, that it hurt, um, it hurt, but it was more like a paper wasp sting, so it was right there in the middle of the Schmidt Pain Index. It wasn't super, super painful. Oh, I did say guy. And I was looking at this specimen earlier, thinking that it, this specimen right here might be male, but we can look at the ladies. All right. Because the ladies are a little more interesting in that they have a scopa. And we'll be able to talk about that in a minute. So, um, our specimen for us who like to keep things measured. 
from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen looks to be approximately two centimeters. Um, I don't believe that I can, let's see, I don't think that I can fit the entire specimen under my microscope. Nope. Um, so that's as far as I can zoom out on this, uh, on this lady. Um, leafcutter bees are kind of cool because they are, um, they are solitary, so they don't actually have a, they don't actually have a, um, a colony that they go back to. All right, so what we're sketching today is called a giant resin bee. So we can write that down. And the scientific name on the giant resin bee is Megakylie something. Mega Kylie Sculpturalis. <laughs> and I can go ahead and write that in the chat because I know sometimes it's hard to read. Alrighty. All right, so that's what we're going to be uh, be sketching today. My autofocus is turned off, so hopefully it stops zooming in and out like it's been. All right, so um, I have a couple of specimens on these on this guy, and I was thinking maybe what we do is we sketch, maybe we sketch the specimen that has its wings kind of open already. Because then you would, we would actually be able to look at and sketch some of the wing venation too. Yeah, this one looks like it's a lady, so she also has a scopa. All right. So, um, I know that a lot of us like to get kind of an overall view of the insect before we start zooming in on different characters and different features. So, I'm going to go ahead and give us an overall sketch of what we're looking at. Going to sketch kind of the head, the thorax, and then down into the abdomen. Um, and then I'm going to give us a little bit of a wings, too. So, obviously, when I'm going through, I'm, I'm sketching lightly. You guys have all sketched with me before. I'm so I love seeing your um your sketches. Sometimes um sometimes when you guys share them with me, I think that's so cool. All right, that head is way too big, and this is why we sketch lightly. I get excited and I sketch the head really big, and then the bug never fits. All right, so. <clears throat> Solitary bees are actually pretty awesome. A lot of times they're what we call stem nesting, and so they'll find um, they'll find a hole in a piece of wood, or they'll find a hole in the center of a stem, and then they will um, they'll go and pack pollen or a food source in there for their babies, and they'll lay an egg. And then afterwards, they will, um, and then afterwards, they'll kind of cap the home off with a small circle of a leaf, and then they'll do it again. They'll pack more pollen and more um, food sources into the into the tube. They'll lay an individual egg. That egg is going to have enough food for that baby to grow up through its entire life and they um, close it off again. So that's kind of a, a cool system that these um, solitary bees have. And if you ever, this one is not native, but if you ever did want um, to attract more native bees to your yard or to a natural space that you have, um, I would suggest putting up a bee hotel. Have you guys heard of bee hotels before?
So a lot of times, um, B hotels are put up by people who want to see more of their native bees, right? Honeybees and honeybees um, are non-native and they make colonies. Bumblebees are native, but um, and they do make large colonies. So that's one bee that's very great at pollinating, is native, and um, actively makes colonies. Um, but a lot of our native bees are solitary or stem nesting, and they don't really get enough credit for what they do. And so giving them a space to grow and um, to grow and multiply is something that we can do for them, as long as we keep their space clean. All right, I'm going to go ahead. I've got my, um, my overall shape of my head, my thorax, and kind of this larger oblong abdomen. I have to get some of this papers out of the way. All right, so I've got my head, my thorax, and this oblong abdomen, and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to add these wings. Now, um, uh, the wings, I'm just going to give them So we can see that our our resin bee has um, four wings, right? Two in the front and two in the back, because it's a hymenopteran. All hymenopteran are going to have four. Um, we know that the only insects that have two wings are dipterans, right? Are the flies, except when we're talking about strepsiptera. <laughs> And I don't have one of those to show you, and I would love to. Goldenrod, for example. Yes, goldenrod is one of those stems that um, bees are really like, they get into. Um, in New Jersey, they have a lot of, um, in New Jersey, they have a lot of invasive uh, bamboo, and they love to, they love the bamboo too, as long as it doesn't get too wide in diameter. So I'm going to zoom in on our head, and we can check out some features here. All right, there's a couple of things that we should be noticing. We have um, what looks like, let me zoom out, yeah, um, we have filiform antenna. So these are straight antenna. Um, I just want to make sure on the other two specimens. Yeah, so these aren't these aren't bent antenna like a lot of bees and wasps are gonna have. Um, so he's got these kind of long, straighter filiform antenna. Um, let's see. I like to add the eyes in first, so I'm gonna go ahead and add my eyes in in this direction. Now our eyes, you can see they come up a little bit and they do go around the head, so I'm gonna give them a little bit of shaping as it goes down and around, hoping to look make it look like it's kind of wrapping around the head just a little bit. Um, and in between, um, in between our compound eyes, we have three ocelli. Man, I need to make these eyes a little bit better. That's fine. All right, so in between these two compound eyes, we have three little ocelli. These are our simple eyes. You can see that they make a little itty bitty triangular formation right here, one, two, three. Those three individual lenses are not for color or shapes. They're more for, um, they're more for light and dark. So they have the ability to see um, shadow. So if an insect or a large bird was flying over top of them, they would be able to see the shadow. Um, they know if they are out in the open or underneath a rock or in a log in their home. So those ocelli are important. Um, O-C-E-L-L-I. All right. And then, um, right in this vicinity, I have got to change the shape of my head just a little bit. Um, and up in this vicinity, this is where our antenna are going to be connected. So we have um, the scape, the 
pedicel, and then the flagellum. All right, those are, I don't know how many times we've talked about the actual, um, the names of the segments on the antenna. Now, a lot of times the first, um, the, the first, escape pedicel, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just had to double check, make sure I was remembering that right. And I am. Of course I am. Stop double double checking yourself. All right, so um, our antenna, this first longer segment, sometimes, well, actually a lot of times, this first segment on the, on the antenna is going to be significantly different or different enough from the rest of the segments that entomologists have actually given them individual names. Um, so this first segment on the antenna is called the scape. And then the second segment on the antenna is going to be up in this direction. And add a little bit more bonus light and we'll probably be able to see it better. There we go. So after our first segment, the scape, then right about here we have a triangular segment. Um, and that is the pedicel, that's the connection, that's the next segment. Um, a lot of times the pedicel is uh, small and triangular um, and it helps bend the rest of the segments, right? So we've got the scape that kind of is lengthier and it gives some distance between the head and the rest of the antenna. We have the pedicel, which is um, spelled P-D-E-I, yeah, P-D-E-I-C-L-E, -E, pedicel. C E L. I'll write that in the chat because I don't think that I wrote it big enough. Hi, Naira. Welcome. All right, and then the rest of these segments all get the same name. The rest of these segments we consider the flagellum, all right? It is the rest of the segments. A lot of times they are very similar to one another, so especially when we're looking at a variety of different antenna types, the scape and the pedestal tend to, um, they, they're named because they do generally look different than the other segments. And we'll notice in this guy that the, um, that the pedestal is separated from the scape by just a little bit. It's a little triangular. And then the rest of these segments, the rest of these segments on the flagellum, they're all straight. They're all linear. Um, and so when we've got antenna like that, we can just... We can give the rest of the antenna kind of a double wide and then break the segments down. Now, with giant resin bees, it doesn't matter. Um, we don't generally count the number of antenna segments with these guys as far as I have, as far as um, I've identified them. I've never had to go back and count these segments. So I wouldn't worry about how many segments you give in there as long as your antenna. The length of the antenna is more important than the number of segments. So this, zooming out a little bit, will give you an idea of how long the antenna should be in comparison to the size of your head and in comparison to the size of your eyes. All right. And so the rest of these, so that I get this labeled, is the flagellum. I had somebody say, hey, don't you have flagellum on other things too? And so sometimes they call, um, sometimes small cell, um, single cell organisms or other animals will have a little tail-like structure on the back and they call that the flagellum. All right. So um, that has a couple of different meanings, but with insects, that's what it means. All right, I'm going to add the other antenna on here just so that he's nice and even, but I'm not going to go ahead and label him again.
No. So we got talking for a minute about bee boxes, and I didn't really finish. Um, and so I do have, if you did want to make yourself a bee hotel, right? If you wanted to make yourself a hotel where the stem nesting bees could come and hang out in, um, I do have some recommendations. Um, I recommend not purchasing one at a store, generally, because they're not really made deep enough. So you want your holes to be under a half an inch, somewhere between a sixteenth of an inch and a half of an inch, depending on what type of insects you're looking for. But then you also want those stems to be at least five inches, if not eight, right? Somewhere in the five to eight inch range is probably ideal for making bee hotels and for the distance for um, having multiple brood in a stem like these guys make. All right. So I'm going back and I'm solidifying some of these lines. I'm not super happy with my compound eyes just yet, so I'm going to leave those alone, but I'm going to come up and I'm going to flatten off the top of his head just a little bit because that point up there is actually for these large chewing mouth parts. They have some pretty awesome mandibles up here in the front. Um, and so let's go ahead and turn his face a little bit so that you can see his mandibles. Yes. Ha <laughs> All right. So this is... There you go. That is the head of our leaf cutter bee. So we're seeing right here, those are the ginormous mandibles that he's going to be using to um, chew through, uh, that, that he's going to be able to use to chew through the wood. Yes, there should be, Marley. I agree. <laughs> People uh, go to the people go to stores and buy these bee boxes, and they're a piece of wood that has like a hole that's like three inches deep, you know. And that's not just not enough for some of these bees, and so you buy them, and then they don't end up being used the way you expect them to, or um, people will purchase them and they're all glued and stuck in together, so there's not really an easy way to clean it. And cleaning your bee hotel at the end of the fall before the next bees show up is actually very important. Um, because if you don't clean your bee hotel, you can actually be spreading disease instead of helping the native bees. All right. So, yeah, I wanted to give you guys an up-close look at these mandibles to give you an idea of what they looked like up front. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of check those out and give my resin bee some some mandibles up here at the front. Now, they're not going to be super obvious because we're looking at it dorsally, um, but maybe I'll come back and sketch it head on. Um, I did also want to make sure that we go back and we're going to look at the ventral side of the abdomen at some point because that is where you can see the defining characteristic for leaf cutter bees. All right, so we've got some compound eyes, we've got the ocelli, we've got the antenna, the mouth parts. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, moving back to the thoracic region. It's so fluffy. All right, so here's uh, the thorax of my insect. Don't mind this big golden dot here. That's the pin, right? Um, we are looking at a lot of times uh, varieties of bees will have lots of hair just like this so that they can help collect pollen, right? And so I would argue that for sure, the pollen definitely gets collected and caught up in those thoracic hairs. 
Um, we call insect hair CD, right? And so I'm going to take my, you know what? The back of the head from this angle, you can see it kind of ends a little more bluntly than I had sketched it. I had sketched it rounded at the edge. So I'm going to come back here and kind of um, give myself that end of that head. And then going to go in and sketch the thorax. Now our thorax is fairly round. And it's got all of those CD that it's going to be using to collect as much pollen as it can. But that's not where it's going to store the pollen that it collects. So it might, my pollen might get super stuck up in the dense hairs of this, um, of the thorax. But um, over time, um, my bee is going to be using, um, using its legs to kind of clean its body off and then collect all of the po pollen actually on the underside of the abdomen. And we will be looking at that. My sketch is going a little off center. That's fine. Let's see. If I pull it back a little bit to the left. Alrighty. Yeah, so we've got that thoracic region that doesn't have a lot of characteristics outside of this right here. You can see these um, D-shaped plates. They have a name. And if Eric Eaton was here, he could remind me of them. But those are essentially the shoulder plates of, um, of, our, of our mega chylid, of our resin bee. And that's where um, he's actually going to be using those to protect all of the muscular structures that help fly the wings, that help with flight. All righty. And I want to finish the abdomen before I go back to the wings. So I think that the abdomen is where they get their name Sculpturalis. Because if we zoom in enough to the abdomen, you can see all of the sculpturing, all of these, um, yeah, look at how pretty it is. All of this sculpturing here on the, um, on the abdominal segments up and around and all of these, like the dimples and the, um, I think that that's where they get their name from because they're Megachyle, which is the base genus, the first genus of um, leafcutter bees. And then Sculpturalis comes from the sculpturing on the abdomen. Um, the abdomen does have where it connects to the thorax. We can see that there are some shoulders, right? We do have a little bit of a waist here. Um, it's not as, uh, it's not as distinct as some wasps, right? Wasp waists are really narrow, but making sure that we do get a little bit of that waist in there is going to be important for our sketches. Um, so giving them a little bit of distinction before coming out and we get these shoulders. And then it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six abdominal segments. And the abdomen stays pretty wide and stout until the end. And then the end kind of, um, and then the end goes down to a point pretty quickly. And so that's going to be... You can see these, uh, the edges of the abdomen run parallel for a minute before they kind of close down at the end. It was this guy, it was one of these, it was one of these individuals that, um, stung me through the net while I was collecting it. It stung me. I think it was the first insect to sting me through a bug net. I was in college and I didn't, I mean, I had thought it through, but I didn't think it through that hard. <laughs> um, all right. So we get one, two, 
three, four, five, six. All right, so we've got six abdominal segments. This first segment is fluffy, just like the thorax, right? So it's got all of these CT and all of these hairs like the thorax has right here on the top and on the sides of the abdomen. Let's zoom in. It's my favorite time. Microscope time. All right, so we're looking at here. We can see that this has a lot of hair that's kind of residual coming down from the thorax, but then the rest of these are pretty smooth, pretty lacking of hair, or the hair that is there is, is black, so it's hard to see against. Um, but you can see that it does have these deeper pockets along the edges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my guy, I'm going to make sure that each one of these segments is separated just a little bit. And um, this guy, uh, each one of the segments, let's see, is kind of constricted against the other one. Instead of, normally we will tuck the segments in like this, like shingles. Um, but this specimen, or these uh, resin bees, instead of having those shingle-like segments, they're going to have more like constrictions in between the abdominal segments. So you'll see they kind of come in and go back out. And the easiest way to get that, even on both sides, is to make sure that you do the overall shape first, and draw the lines, and then go back and erase. Really, that's going to be the easiest way to get these look to look even and nice and uniform. All right. And then I'm going to go back in and starting on the second abdominal segment, it looks like, going in and adding all of these cool pits. Um, larger pits, it looks like, up on the edges coming up in this area here. And then kind of smaller ones. And then this is smooth. And so I think that that, um, the, that feature on the abdominal segment is really kind of cool. And so I wanted to show that a little bit by giving these larger pockets that are like little circles. And then going back and adding, a, adding dots in where these smaller ones would be. And hopefully we get a very similar texture for our for our sketch. All right, and then I'm going to move down to the next one, and I'm going to go ahead and give some of the same ones. I'm pretty happy with how this is coming. All right, and then come in this way. And that's something that's a little bit easier with a pen rather than graphite. So if you're working with um, with pen and ink, um, it's going to be a little bit easier to, to give those sh shading dots that have names. That's fine. Alrighty. Alright. And so the rest of the the rest of these segments, the sculpturing is not as is not as intense. So I'm not going to spend as much time giving sculpturing in these last segments. I think that that was really important because it's where the name comes from. Oh, it's so pretty. I'm pretty happy. Okay, now the wings. Now. Um, we did take time together. We had a there was a Thursday session. We took time together to sketch some wing venation. We did the wings of a honeybee a while ago, and we looked at the subcoastal cells, right? I believe of which they have three. Um, 
leaf cutter bees. So we're looking here along the top, along the top of the wing. This is the costa, the thickest vein on the wing, and it's what hold. It's their support system. It's what kind of holds everything up. Um, if you are pinning insects and collecting insects, you actually use that vein to pull the wing up to spread it. Um, and the in all insects, this first vein is called the costa. C O S T A. Now, um, down here, we've got this cell right here and this cell right here. I could even make my dot just a little bit smaller so that it's more distinct. This cell right here and this cell right there. So we've got two subcoastal cells. Um, and that's going to be characteristic. Now, there are a variety of families that have two subcoastal cells, but it kind of helps you narrow it down, essentially. Um, so when we see that, we know it's not an apid, at least. All right, so I'm going in and giving the outlines of my wings. All righty. And then... Um, I'm coming back in. I want to make sure that the leading edge of the wing is nice and thick because that's the edge of the wing, but also the coastal the the coastal vein. Um, you do have this little segment right here, which I don't remember what it's called. But then you have these two subcoastal cells that that surround it. You've got one that comes off here, and I think this next one kind of looks like a shoe. It looks like a boot because it has this toe feature right here. Um, and then we have this vein that comes down on a diag. Now that one in in some families is going to be straight and in some families is going to be kind of a wave or an arch. It looks like in this family it's straight. All right. And then coming down to match that, we've got another vein here that comes through. And the rest of the veins, after you've got the subcosta and this vein that connects down, the rest of these are not as important. They're not identifying or characteristic features um, for the most part. They're not ones that people generally worry about. So um, when I'm sketching, I'll generally take that into consideration. I'll say, all right, I know that this cell and that cell are really important, so I'm going to make sure that I sketch these ones well. But if the rest of them aren't as important, I'll try to get the lines about right, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about all the little cells in the bottom if from, a, if from the artist's point of view it's not as important. All right, and then we've got the hind wing, which we can actually see this time. So we might as well sketch it, because um, a lot of times in bees and wasps, we don't have the ability to see the hind wing when it's when the wings are closed. Um, so a lot of times in hind wings, what we'll see is <clears throat> a larger cell that's kind of circular or ovoid from the base that comes down. And then uh, many other veins that break off of that. All right, that is um, a general hind wing wing venation. So you can come in and you can give yourself that larger circular cell. And then f off of that cell, you can just go in and add these veins that run all the way to the edges. <laughs> too much time on it, but oh my goodness, I have so many beautiful, awesome... All right, check this out. So this is a super, super old book that was being thrown away at MSU, and so I decided to save it. I have a variety of keys and books and stuff that were being thrown away that they said, all right, anyone who wants them, and I said, I want them. All right, so this is the Guide to the Study of Wings of Insects. And somebody went through and sketched 
every single wing vein on so many different types of insects. And um, these are all plates. And you can see that each one of the veins is labeled and each one of the cells is labeled. And I can tell you, these sketches, they just make they make my heart happy. <laughs> yeah, there's so many of them. There are hundreds of plates here of hand-drawn wing venations with every single one of these cells. Um, and so it's something that, yeah, it's something that I love, um, but they are, they can be very, very overwhelming. So when I think about that, I then come to this book and I flip through it and think, wow, somebody took the time to do this, you know? I'm going to put it back before I get too sidetracked. I have so many wing venation books, though, guys. <laughs> All right. Um, so... I'm actually kind of happy. All right, so we've got our head, our thorax, our abdomen, our wings. Now, a lot of times we go in... <laughs> I don't know. Let's see what decade was. I think the decade matters for that question. Um, this was in the 1930s. This was um, 1931. Wow. Good sense is of all things in the world the most equally distributed for everybody thinks himself so abundantly provided with it that even those most difficult to please in all other matters do not commonly desire more of it than they already possess. quotes. <clears throat> Alrighty. I think some of the best entomological work happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, I would argue that that's very much true. Because um, a lot of that science back in the 1930s and the 1940s, it was just pure science. It was entomologists, men and women who, mostly men, but there were a couple women, um, men and women who just wanted to study bugs, who, who liked insects just for you know, being outside and being a part of nature and learning more about them and figuring out how they fit into our world and how we fit into their world. And I feel like back in the 1930s, the, the research was funded for knowledge and for, and for like the betterment of, you know, the natural world and the community. Um, and over the course of time, it has turned more into like, well, what can they do for us? And a lot of times research doesn't get funded unless you can prove ahead of time how it's going to help the grand scheme of things. Um, whereas, you know, back in the 1930s, there are so many papers out there that are just like, I brought these bugs inside and I raised them and this is what they turned into and we didn't know that this immature turned into this adult and so now we uh and now we know right and so it was so like pure I feel like back back in the day and I know that like there were all of the male female problems and stuff but it was just a little different <laughs> all right so um I want to, we've got, we've got wings, um, we can't really see the legs from the dorsal side, so I want to flip this specimen over, plus, I've mentioned a scopa, but I haven't shown it to you yet. All right, so on the underside 
of the abdomen. If I zoom in enough, and my microscope lighting is just right. That's almost there. I think that's pretty close. Um, we might be able to see it better in one of the other specimens, but it is right here. This is the scopa, and what we're looking at are really, really long hairs along the bottom side of the abdomen, and I can see them very well but through my through the microscope by myself but my camera is not picking them up as well so what i'm going to try and do is show you a different specimen um because i have another specimen here that i was showing to students this one might be a little bit easier to see So when we're talking about bees that pollinate, right, bees that want to collect pollen and take it back to a nest or a home or feed their be babies, right, with honeybees, they have a pollen basket. So they have a place on their hind that's much better. Look at, you can much, you can see those hairs way better. All right. All right, so a lot of times when we're talking about honeybees, honeybees on their hind legs have a pollen basket. They have a series of very long hairs that as they're collecting pollen and as pollen collects on them, they clean off their body and they, they compact all of that pollen onto their hind legs. Well, um, megachylids or leaf cutting bees will do the same thing. But instead of packing it onto their legs, they actually pack their pollen along the bottom side of their abdomen. This is actually really easy to see in the wild. So um, if you do ever see a bee flying from pollen, f flying from flower to flower, um, pollinating, drinking themselves some neck, some yummy nectar, and you see that the bottom side of their abdomen is completely covered in yellow pollen, they are a leaf cutting bee. All right. This giant resin bee that's, what did we say, two centimeters long? It's a fairly large bee. It's a one of the larger leaf cutting bees that, um, that are in the U.S., that uh, at least in, at least in Michigan where this was collected. Um, <laughs> and so Scopa is, uh, spelled S-C-O-P-A, and I'm just going to point to, um, I just pointed to the underside of my abdomen, but, um, is the Scopa is going to be right here where all of these long hairs are. Now, um, if you wanted to get technical, um, the pollen basket on a hind on a honeybee's hind leg is also a scopa so scopa is the name for insect long hairs that are used to collect pollen um and they can be on a variety of locations uh it's just that honeybees they get so much attention and they they got a special word for their pollen basket it's like a specific type of scopa. If you want to, like, scopa is the umbrella term for all of them. And then honeybees have a pollen basket. <laughs> uh. All right. So there are a couple of things. I do, I'm going to flip my, I'm going to flip my page over. And I want to look at a couple of different parts of my, um, a couple of different parts of the bee. Um, I'm thinking... You've had the chance to draw a scope if you wanted to. I could sketch one, but I'm thinking we looked at the we looked at the mandibles of our of our giant resin bee, but the one that we looked at didn't have his tongue sticking out, and this one has its tongue sticking out. I have 
to agree with you, Deborah. Yeah, so they have a system. I was actually thinking about this today. I was um, sitting on the side of the lake watching some ducks. And, um, oh, because I went out aquatic collecting today, I saw a five-inch tadpole, like a huge tadpole. It was a, uh, it was a bullfrog tadpole. And, um, the head of that thing must have been, like, two inches. It was wild. Um, yeah, and I think that that's really cool, Deborah. So, I was thinking, I was looking at, um, I was watching this duck swim across the pond and thinking about some of, like, my behavioral studies in college and thinking about how animals react, animals react to, um, to their environment and to outside stimuli, right? And a behavioralist can watch an animal and list enlist their behaviors, right? And then try to determine what triggers those behaviors. And it's almost robotic in that way, right? These animals that, that they are, that they interact with the world, they've got a series of maneuvers that they can do, and they do those in order, right? So this honeybee, they go to the, they go to the nectar and they deliberately, they're going to collect that pollen. They're going to, they're going to push it down into their legs. They kind of smash it down. You know, they'll use those tarsal claws. And I think that's another really cool thing about viewing, <clears throat> uh, viewing insects closer is you get to see some of the, um, you get to see some of the characteristics, uh, like how they, how they have successfully done some of these things, right? So it's like, yes, they clean themselves, but check out these tarsal claws, right? That's how they have the ability to scrape um, and stuff. So yeah, that's fun. Alrighty, checking out the tongue of our... So bees not only, um, especially leafcutter bees, they not only have, um, the mandibles for chewing, they also need some type of lapping mouth part. They need to be able to drink nectar. Now, <clears throat> I was looking at this mouth part a little earlier and trying to come up with, like, the, the, in these individual parts, what they might do. That's one heck of a Halloween mask. Oh, man, Ivea, I have to agree with you. Especially if you, um, especially if you had that bit, like, the long mustache, like, hairs up here. Oh man, it would be pretty spooky. And then you would ha you could have these you could have your tongue like mouth part sticking up the bottom and it I mean this thing looks creepy. We're going to we're going to zoom in right here at some point and um you'll be able to see that's where the uptake of liquids comes in. Now um these are the mandibles up here in the front and then if we zoom into this area, we have a couple of different pieces. Now I can tell you what some of them do but not what all of them do. All right, so um, a lot of times when we have a lapping mouth part or a sponge-like mouth part where we're kind of drinking, it's in a sheath, right? It's protected on both sides because it's sensitive. And so right here, so right here, this is kind of the sheath. This is the protective covering for our mouth part. Um, this right here is a uh, labial pulp. So that's going to be one of those pulpy up in the front that we like to call mouth fingers. <laughs> um, this, I got nothing. Uh, if any of you guys know, I would love to know. Um, and then we have this. Now this is the actual drinking mouth part. And so we can see it's kind of solid here at the base, but as we zoom into the top, Oh, 
cool. Yeah, so as we zoom into the top, this is the zoomed in image of the very, very, very tip of my leaf cutter bee's lapping mouth part. So it's her tongue. And you can see she's got it covered in hairs, covered in little hairs. And I believe those hairs are going to help the help connect to that, you know, sticky, sugary substance and help her drink it. Now, I was trying to zoom in even further to see what's on that very, very end, but I can't tell. Um, I can tell you that this whole mouth part starting right here at the end and then moving all the way up until about here is covered, absolutely covered in fine hairs. Um, so that is actually something that we also saw on the honeybee. We saw that long, long straw-like mouth part with lots of hairs at the end for the uptake of fluids. <laughs> I must have thrown my pencil somewhere. Did you guys see me throw my pencil? <laughs> huh. Bonus pencil? No bonus pencil. All right. We got a pencil from the abyss. All right. So, if I was going to sketch this, if I was going to sketch this mouth part, I would give it um both of those mandibles up here in the front. I'm going to zoom out to the mouth part so you can see those a little bit. Yeah. So I would give it these mandibles right here, kind of at this angle, nice and sharp. Um, if you've ever seen a, um, if you've ever seen a leaf that was uh, chewed on by a leaf cutter bee, you'll notice that they chew their leaves in perfect circles. It's actually kind of impressive. Um, so if you ever see a leaf that has a perfect circle cut out of it, you can know that it was likely a leaf cutter bee. Now, um, things like caterpillars will eat um, holes on the leaves, but a lot of times when a caterpillar is eating a leaf, your hole is going to look kind of like this because they, ch actually in the other direction. Gonna look, it's gonna look like this because they chew with the angle of their head and then they move and then they chew and then they move. Um, but if you were, if you had a leaf that was chewed on by a leaf cutter bee, you're gonna see just one straight circle. All right. So we have um, the mandibles. We have this uh, sheath that actually comes down um, and separates into two at the end. And a lot of times people will see that sheath and think that that's the mouth part because it's what's obvious. It's what you can see most of the time. Um, but that's just the protective covering of the long straw-like mouth part that we were just looking at that's so fluffy right here with, I'm going to call them uptake hairs. Um, I don't know if that's what they're called. It almost also looks like it's segmented. Like there would be a segment from here to about here, another segment from here to about here, and then here to the end. It almost looks three segmented to me. Um... That's how I'm going to sketch mine. <laughs> and then we have this um, labial pulp over here to the right. I'm going to go ahead and erase this really quick. Uh, 
And then we have this mouth finger, right? This labial pulp that comes down. He should have one of those on each side. So I guess it's possible that this is the labial pulp for the other side, but it doesn't seem to match. So I'm not happy with that answer yet. Um, I'm going to add the fluffy mustache up to the top of the mandibles because I feel like that is characteristic and it also makes all of us laugh and all of us smile. And sometimes we just need that, huh? The fluffy mustache down into the mandibles with the sheath and the, 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 the licky part. Awesome. So we got to see a giant resin bee, the mega chylid. Um, let's see. Is there anywhere else on the body we would really like to check out? I know we didn't really look too much at the legs, so we could check those out if you'd like. We could throw her on her lateral. Your tarsi are tucked under, babe. What are we supposed to do with that? She says, I don't know. I'm not the one sketching me. All right, we're going to scoot it down one. Aha, we can see those. The rear end. Good idea. straight on at the end of the abdomen. Let's see. There is actually a little bit of a slit or an opening where the stinger would come out. I was hoping that one of them would have her stinger out, but that is not the case. Um, she's so dark. So I was trying to show you right about here, there's an opening at the end of her abdomen and that's where the stinger would come out of. It's almost like a slit. It goes from here to about here and it opens. Um, from this focus, we can also see the hind tarsal claws, but there might not be too much interesting happening at the end of our abdomen here. Let's see. I mean, those tarsal claws are pretty wicked. But at the end of the abdomen, we do have a good amount of hair. Um, we don't really have a stinger that's visible. And I tried to look on the other specimens, too, to see if I could find one. We can look at this one to see if it looks any different. But I believe that they're all going to be about the same. Yeah, so they come down to almost a smiley opening. <laughs> and those tarsal claws. I honestly, I wonder what they're holding on to.
So if we were looking at the hind leg, we have a femur up in this direction. Let's see. Ah, yes, I collected it on East Lansing on campus. Um, <clears throat> we've got a femur. We've got this tibia. The tibia does actually have a pretty decent tibial spur. It's um, long and pointed. It might even have two. I can only see one from this angle. You're welcome, Deb. And then, aha, so there's the one tibial spur, and then the rest of these segments are tarsal segments. They're going one, two, three, four, five, and then the really awesome tarsal claws. So we're coming to that time of day where we're just at an hour. We have sketched one. We could sketch another. Um, I know in the past I have teased, uh, gyrinids or, um, whirligig beetles. You guys like to vote on hymenopteran, but I do have, my collection is mostly beetles. I was actually looking at my stats because I just put all of my, um, my entire collection on Excel to database it so that I could kind of see it. Um, see whereabouts I have most of my specimens. And let's see. Uh, I have 176 beetles in my collection. <laughs> and only my next largest is uh, butterflies and moths at 71. So I, I, I think... We should do a beetle next time. Naira says she has to call it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I super appreciate everybody hanging out and sketching with me. If it sounds like we're going to be closing a night, I want to say, I want to draw you guys this really quick because I think when I was talking about it, I didn't explain it very well. So if we're talking about a stem nesting bee, right? We have a stem here, and that stem is a whole. It can be anywhere from a sixteenth of an inch to a half an inch, but then there's an end, so five to eight inches between here and here, and then as the bees crawl in, they actually stack all of their pollen. Um, they stack their pollen at the base, and they stack it, and they push it, and they stack it, and they push it, and they lay a singular egg, one egg there, and then they know that there is enough pollen here to raise this egg from um, grub all the way into being an adult. And so they make sure that there's enough pollen and enough food source. Sometimes it's a lot of pollen. Sometimes um, stem nesting bees will even feed their young like paralyzed spiders or other paralyzed insects like crickets or grasshoppers or small baby grasshoppers. And so... Um, they'll stack this nest with as much food as that baby is going to need. And then they'll take, because we're talking about leaf cutter bees, they'll take that circular cut of the leaf and they put it right here. And they cap that section off. And they say, all right, that baby is taken care of. I don't have to worry about that baby anymore. And then they start again. And they start stacking pollen and food sources and all the things that they need. And they lay another egg, right? And so they'll do that over and over again up until they fill the whole stem. All right? And then they move on to the next one. So if your stem isn't deep enough for the bee to think, oh wow, it's really worth my time, they're probably not gonna spend a lot of time in your hotel. And so that's gonna be one of the important things and one of the things to think about is this hotel isn't for just an individual to grow up in that stem. They want many to grow up over the course of time. And then these guys will stay enclosed in here all summer long. They pupate in the fall. They live here for the winter time. And then the next spring, they'll emerge. All right. And after that spring, after they all emerge, that's when you want to go back in and clean up your hive and make sure that you aren't tra transmitting any diseases and all of that type of stuff. All right. So that is my little um, little bonus information on stem nesting bees. I think it's about time to um, I think it's about time to say goodbye. So 
I'm going to flip over over here. Um, thank you, everybody, for hanging out with me today. I hope that you all have enjoyed this session and continue to enjoy them. I try to keep them, um, I try to keep them interesting and different from one week to the next. Um, please let me know if you have a suggested insect for next week. Um... I'll always have a Hymenoptera next to my microscope for the next time we say, Hymenoptera, let's do it, because I've got all different types of insects, and I absolutely love it. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Avea. I super appreciate everybody who comes and joins me. Um, honestly, you guys make my day. And so... Um, there's a couple of things on my screen with me. Right here, that is where I teach for students. So if you know a kid, 5 to 8, 9 to 12, a teenager who wants to learn how to make YouTube videos, uh, you can go to OutSchool. The, um, the actual link is down in the description bar. And you can go there and you can sign up for classes with me. I've got weekly bug clubs that 9 to 12 year olds can join. And then we talk about a different bug every week and they get to meet other students who are also bug lovers. And we have generally a great time. <laughs> All right. Um, that's this is to remind you to subscribe to my channel. Thank you guys so much. Most of you have already done that. I think we've now made it so that over 50% of the people who watch my channel are actually subscribed. That's kind of exciting to me. Um, thank you guys for helping me break 1,300 subscribers. That was an exciting moment. Um, happened in the last couple of weeks. And then, this right here is my PayPal account for Insectopia. So, um, if you would like to help support my love of insects to help me, um, to help me get out there and to continue teaching both, birth, both virtually and in person, help buy me a coffee. Sometimes I need it. If you've really enjoyed taking this class and you'd like to tip me, all right, those are all things that you can do there at that link or from the link in the description box. Um, I have an Instagram. I play Guess That Bug. So one of you guys is going to take me up on the offer. I just know it. Join me on Instagram or on my Facebook page and watch these really cool microscope pictures come by. Try and guess what bug it is. I think that, um, I think that a lot of you would probably be able to guess insects to order, if not to family, based on what you have already learned with me, right? I think that if you got a really close-up image of an elytra, for instance, I think that you would probably recognize that as a beetle. Or, um, or a close-up of the ocelli of a hymenopteran. I bet you, you could guess that it was a bee or a wasp based on the fact that it had those triangular ocelli in some of the hairs. I bet you guys could do that. And so join me and play Guess That Bug. Um, I have a great time with it. So, um, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I super, super appreciate it. Let me know what you think we should sketch next week. And I will see you on Thursday. Bye, everybody.